May the words of my mouth and meditations of my heart be accepted on my sight, my Lord and Redeemer, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Please be seated. Well, as uh, we spent some, as I mentioned before, some time talking about how wonderful the creation of this world and you in the cosmos uh, is, and how difficult, difficult it is to understand, and in fact, how science is discovering how absolutely stunning and multidimensional everything is, um, which if you, if you read, uh, for those of us that are not deeply involved in some of this uh, uh, jargon, the whole fact that time itself can be changed and warped, etc., and gravity is considered to be like a bouncing a trampoline because of, it kind of comes around things and it curves in space and all of that stuff that you and I go, oh wow, let's go, let's watch that program again. That was really fun to watch. It's all created by our Lord. Everything was put together by Him. That's why I feel so wonderful about all the discoveries. I believe that more we discover, the more we're going to dis discover the Lord. I don't care how anti-God anyone is, every time you turn around and you see a new discovery and you look at uh, around to your partner or whomever and you say, this is just amazing. God is amazing. Sooner or later, as that old adage goes with the scientist climbing the mountain to try to get to the top to find out what truth is, and the prophet is sitting at the top and he already knew all along what the truth was. So it's interesting that once we get there, we're going to realize that faith, the word faith and the word love, actually define the entire creation. Well, today I wanted to briefly go over the first part uh, of talking about communion, talking about the sacrament of communion. It's the one that I always mention to you, pierces through time. Or if you put it another way, Christ pierces through time and comes to us. You know, the Lord Jesus, if you might remember when this happened, it didn't happen after he died. The Lord Jesus, on the night before he suffered on the cross, shared one last meal with his disciples. And during this meal, our Savior instituted the sacrament of his body and blood. He did, he did this to continue the sacrifice of the cross throughout all ages and to entrust the, the church, his spouse, um, as a memorial. Now, please, we're not doing a Protestant thing here. A memorial is, oh, let's sit down uh, like July 4th, have some hot dogs, think about the country, and then go on our way because a memorial is nothing more than just to remember something. Uh, remembering a, a, me a member of our family, remembering something in our country. Remember, I've said it many times, the word memorial as translated actually is the word anamnesis, which is the Jewish concept of being present, but not present as of that moment. That is, you have something like the cross is happening, but it's happening all the time and therefore it is present. The memorial is not just a remembrance, it's an actual event that is before you. Very Jewish, and it should have been, in its concept. And it's the anamnesis of his death and resurrection. As the Gospel of Matthew tells us, while they were eating, Jesus was still alive, remember? While they were eating, Jesus took bread and said the blessing, broke it. Giving it to his disciples, he said, take and eat, this is my body. Now, he's standing right there. Take and eat this, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying what? Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which will be shed on behalf of many for the forgiveness of sins. Now, that's in Matthew and Mark and Luke and 1 Corinthians. It, it's everywhere in the New Testament. Now, recalling these words of Jesus, the Anglican Catholic Church confesses that in the celebration of the Eucharist, the bread and the wine become the body and blood of Christ. Now, what do I mean by become? We are not using the Roman Catholic concept here that it is a, um, um, an appearance. There is something that we see, but we can't really see the body. The, the, the wine is the blood, but we can't really see it. It basically is translating God back into mortal existence. God didn't say that. Christ said, this is my body. He didn't say how. He said, this is my blood. He didn't say how. What he did say was, I am with you by you acting, taking the bread, taking the wine, 
I am mystically present. He didn't say, well, we'll get to that in a second. So recalling this then, the power of the Holy Spirit is present, if you will, in the prayers of the priest. That's why if the, the, the adage is in seminary, if you have an attending priest or an attending deacon and the priest has a heart attack while he's in, in the middle of the, the mass, you simply step over the priest while someone's taking him off and you continue the service. The priest is not the important component. The priest is in fact the person who is acting on behalf of Christ that, is, that creates this mystical event on the altar. Jesus said what? I am the living bread that came down from heaven. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. For my flesh is true food and my blood is to true drink. That's in John 6. Well, he didn't say you're going to eat a chunk of me. What he was saying, if you read the interpretation of the original wording, it basically means I am mystically with you. Because what happens? Remember the term transfiguration? The transfiguration of Christ? When he went to heaven, his body was transfigured. If you will, became bright, became shiny if you want to use that term, it was transfigured. He mystically now exists for us. He knew that, and he was preparing us for that. That's why I find it so interesting when I still get comments, well, you guys are just cannibals. You think you're cannibals up there. You're eating. No, that's not. You Please read the Bible. You'll understand better if we can teach you a little bit better. This is what the church means when she speaks of the real presence of Christ in communion. This presence of Christ in communion is called real, not to exclude other types of presence. I mean, he's really present in other places and times, but the real presence of the communion is very important. What does it mean that Jesus Christ is present in the Eucharist when we have the bread and wine and how does it happen? The presence of the risen Christ in the Eucharist is an infinite mystery. And if you have a priest that tells you that he can, he can kind of explain it to you, I think I'd go someplace else because he really doesn't know. We none of us know. We must remember that the triune God is the creator of everything that exists and has the power to do anything beyond what we could even imagine. As St. Ambrose said, if the word of the Lord Jesus is so powerful as to bring into existence things which were not, then a fortiori, those things which already exist can be changed into something else. St. Ambrose. God created the world to share his life with persons who are not God. And I know that we have Scientology here in town and Thetans inside of each one of those Scientologists are many gods. That's why I always have an interesting argument with, with Scientologists. Uh, it's interesting when it comes out of actually a sci-fi writer that started this whole thing. But they actually believe that they are an extension of God, faith and within them. All they have to do is get to that level, I guess it's how much money you donate, get to that level and you actually are part of God. Or in, in essence, you are a God. Uh, we don't believe in extension in Christianity. We are a creation. We will never be God. I'm sorry, you can try. But you're never, if you're a Virgo, maybe that's what you want to be. If I understand horoscopes properly, I don't know. But you're not going to get there. You're just not going to get there. God reveals his truth to us in ways that we can understand through what? Faith. That's why you have, faith is so wonderful. It is not demeaning. I always like to, in college, I don't know if you've ever heard those stories in college where somebody who uh, might be in the college of, uh, I'm going to pick on somebody here. College of Engineering, and uh, somebody else is in the College of Engineering, and they've decided, well, I didn't pass that last exam, so I think I'm going to change my, my major to psychology. And they miss that exam, so they change their major to something else, sort of down the feeding chain. Uh, and I always love these kids in college, like, yeah, this guy is going to end up in this school over here. Watch, you know, he's just not doing very well. It's interesting when you watch 18 and 19 year olds making their comments in very difficult 
pre-med, engineering, mathematics, all of those kinds of things. Well, God reveals the truth to us here, if you will, that faith through grace is indwelling. Faith is not the lower level. <laughs> it's not something that people do when they can't figure things out. Faith is on the top. Faith is giving yourself totally to what Christ has asked for. That's like staying in the College of Engineering and not going anywhere because you have faith, you're with him. He will be with you forever. We are thus aided to understand, at least in some measure, that what would otherwise remain unknown to us, though we can never comprehend the mystery of God. As the atheists like to say, well, you guys don't understand your own God. And I would stand and say, yep, got that right. I know one thing. He's created us, and I know the second thing. I have faith and love for him. Now, what do you have faith and love in? I'm not sure atheists have that in anything. As successors to the, of the apostles and teachers of the church, the priests have the duty to hand, to hand on what God has revealed to us and to encourage all members of the church to deepen their understanding of this mystery. Please understand, you're never going to understand the mystery of, of the church or of communion. So why does Jesus give himself to us as food and drink then? Now, you know my old adage, he calls us how many times? More than 250 times we're called sheep. So we kind of bumble along and you know, we need a shepherd to his voice so we don't fall over the cliff, which we would do without him helping us. So Jesus gives himself to us in the Eucharist in spiritual nourishment because he loves us. You can't love God without God loving us first. And if you think you can love God first, then you are stuck in the wrong world. You are unable to even love your partners, your husband, your wife, your children, your grandchildren, unless you love God first. God's whole plan for our salvation is directed to our participation in the life of the Trinity, the communion of the Father, the Son, and the... we tend to think of communion, and I, I've asked children that, well, teenagers, uh, when you receive communion, who do you receive? I receive Jesus Christ. No. You receive the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus is just as much God as God the Father is. You receive all of the Trinity at one time. God's whole plan then is for you to do that. It is strengthened and increased. We start with baptism, it's strengthened and increased in confirmation, and it's nourished, deepened by the Eucharist. By eating the body and drinking the blood of Christ in the Eucharist, we become united with Christ. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. That's John 6. In being united to the humanity of Christ, we are at the same time united in his divinity. I've realized I just said to you, you can't be God, and you, you and I never will be. But we are united in his divinity, not ours. We are not divine. He has brought us close to his bosom, the divinity of Christ, so that we might be nourished. If you will, just as the living Father sent me and I have sent life because of the Father, so also the one who feeds on me will have life because of me. John 6. By being united to Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, which means God is dwelling in you, we are drawn up into the eternal relationship of love between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I mentioned that to you previously. Think of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit like an atom. Proton, neutrons, and electrons. It is bound so tightly by the greatest of the four forces, and now we discover there are five. The four forces that hold, the, the strong nuclear force that holds it all together, holds us all together. Christ is bringing you into that strength, that combination, that tightness of the Trinity. Through the sacraments of baptism and confirmation, another term for that in the in ancient Greek is charismation, we are temples of the Holy Spirit who dwells in us and by his indwelling we are made holy by the gift of sanctifying grace. Your mama was right. You are a temple and you need to take care of that temple. I don't know about you, but I heard that a lot. She was right. We are a temple within which the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit wraps around us and holds our faith 
into his bosom. The ultimate promise of the gospel is that we will share in the life of the Trinity. It's that simple. All of the gospel is about one thing, our sharing life in the Trinity. The fathers of the church called this participation in the divine life divinization. I even said that, didn't I? Divinization or theosis, if you will. In this, we see God does not merely send us good things. Here, I think I'll give them. I love that. Would you ever watch those movies about the Greek stuff? The Greek gods kind of fought amongst themselves and fought with humans, and then there were half humans and half gods. And uh, It's kind of, kind of cool reading. It is fiction, but it's kind of cool reading when you read the old Greek texts. In essence, though, uh, divinization is a little different. In this, we see that God doesn't send us good things. Boom. I think I'm going to give them, I'll give them the special sword and the special shield, and, and he'll fight on behalf of God. God doesn't do that. He just doesn't do that. Instead, we are brought up into the inner life of God. He doesn't throw things down to us. He wraps around us and brings us up to him. We're brought into the inner life of God, the communion. Just think of it. How amazing is that? That you are brought into the communion of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I don't know about you, but I don't deserve it. I'm not too sure I know very many people that do. There are some saints out there, which you all should be, but there are some a little bit more saintly than others. And even those individuals have gone, for example, St. Teresa. I love the story about St. Teresa. Three separate times she went to the Pope and said, I've lost my faith. And three separate times he sent her back and said, no, 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 it's not your faith. You have the wrong perspective. You are God's child. Faith is to accept your living within the Trinity. In the celebration of the Eucharist, which means, by the way, the Eucharist means Thanksgiving. So communion is one thing. We tend to call it the Eucharist. And you think of communion. But the Eucharist is our entire Mass, the celebration, within which we receive communion. We give praise and glory to God for that sublime gift. We will continue a little bit more with our discovery of Holy, of, uh, Holy Communion, but we'll do that in the coming weeks. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.